music again. We started off with this beautiful, it was a calypso, it felt like, you know, it's, it's from the diaspora. But a lot of us, a lot of us get up Saturday mornings and we clean our house to music. Yes. We cook to music. Yes. What is that tie for people of African indigenous descent and the drum and cooking and cleaning? And what is that tie? Are we the only people that do that? Do that? No, we're not the only people that do it, but we're the people who do it like we do it. So we have this deep need to connect to that. Whether it's Frankie Beverly and Mays, and when you hear that, you know your mother's telling you to get, get up and clean, or we are that mother. Um, in our house, when we hear Bob Marley on a Sunday, we're like, oh. <laughs> but as we're doing the work, the drum moves us forward, you know, into that. And then what moves us Further than that is that we smell things steeping, we smell things stewing, we smell onions being cut and garlic. That's what it smells like in here right now. Is it's like how I smell in here, Ali? It smells wonderful. Ali came All the in spices. the door. Ali came in my door because we just leave the door open. Ali <laughs> and Ali came in and he's like, mm. right? And that's what you want. The mm is the funk. And so our music has the funk, our food has the funk, we eat with the funk, we sleep, sleep with, with the, the funk. funk. <laughs> <laughs> so we have this ability to take our pain and just lay on it the salve, the bomb of Gilead, right? We're laying that bomb on us of this is what soothes my soul. This is what soothes my soul, these soul food memories. And so soul food is throughout our diaspora, it's not just like, this is Southern, um, you know, cuisine. It, it We have soul food in everywhere we go. And we see Africa, wherever the plantain points, that's Africa, wherever the, <laughs> the okra <laughs> point, wherever you see uh, certain things like you, and we we've been talking about porridges like last week, when we talk about grains that have been, um, or foods that have been made into what we would consider like a mush, like a substrate under food, under our uh, juicy things on top. We're talking about fufu. We're talking about the ability to eat with our hands and connect with our food. And with our hands, we do this work. We were brought here, many of us, to do work with our hands, whether it's chopping sugarcane, farming rice, you know, uh, all of that we also eat with our hands. So that cleaning, cooking, music, setting things straight. We may not have much, many of us, uh, as we were brought into the new world, but what we had was the ability to keep our spaces organized. Because as my great grandmother would say, uh, good spirits only come to clean spaces. So that's why when we set up altars, there's a cleansing process. That's why, you know, some of us, our grandmother might put salt at the front door or put the broom at the front door upside down or whatever. It's just clearing foolishness. It's cleansing out things. It makes a difference. And traditionally, we would use herbs and like water and flash in the corners of our house. And we still see that with sage. We see that with um, pine saw. Right. And these cleansers that are piney and uh, herby and, you know, lavender, all of these things. Right. So these are all in that mint family. We associate that with cleanliness because that's what we were already doing. I hope that makes us makes sense. Um, so today I know that you're not going to be on camera, uh, Dr. Hunter. What I'm going to do is talk a bit about our journey rice. I'm not going to get totally into it because we're going to do a segment just on rice. It deserves its own segment, but we're going to talk a bit about rice and rice for you today, Professor Hunter, is going to be rest, uh, ice, uh, compress, and elevate. That's, yes. <laughs> that's yeah. your rice today. Uh, and for the Nubians, we're going to get into some of what we're doing here. So today, the music you were listening to, that what? My favorite singer, my favorite Puerto Rican singer, let me say that, is Hector Lavo. And so what you were listening to was Hector Lavo. And I just, I can't get enough Hector Lavo. I'm sorry. There's a lot of bands that play salsa. And, and as we travel around the diaspora, 
by spoon and, and hands. Um, I'll make sure to play you something at the beginning. I'll ask Professor Hunter to play something because what we want to do is connect how we sound in the kitchen. You know, like as, as, as you were saying, Professor Hunter, like we connect that to our joy and we want to put good spirits and like heartfelt feelings in our food and nothing touches us like music. We have to have the drum. Many of us were separated from the drum and we use the stomp, the ring shout, the, um, the hand claps, uh, other ways to, you know, beating on our che chest, finding boxes and beating on the boxes, like making wooden boxes. And in the Caribbean, the fortunate thing for a lot of us in Brazil, in the Caribbean was that there were lots of places where the drum still remained. And so you hear it in the music. So when you're listening to Het Pelavo, you're hearing all that drumming and lots of his songs have that underpinning of the sounds we would have ordinarily. Um, so it's no surprise that we're cooking Puerto Rico today. And what I wanted to do for you was some things that I grew up with that are some of my favorite Puerto Rican foods because growing up in New York City, uh, just my most of my friend group were also Caribbeans or other folk, right? Like Koreans and some Chinese kids or whatever. But like we had a real thick crew, international crew. We rolled deep in the Caribbean parts. And so as I would go to their house and have dinner, some of my Puerto Rican friends, the food was exactly like what we would have in our house, but they had differences, right? So it was similar, let's say that. There were differences in the spices that were that maybe used like some of the key principal ones. And then what we may also have is um, uh, some of our other changes in our diets was because of the overlay of slaves, enslaved people, let's call it that, right? Kidnapped and enslaved people brought to the new world in layers. So you see those layers in the layers of the food. So I'm going to start on this side. Ali says start over here. So I'm going to do it. He's, Let's get it. He's missed Take him on the journey. So we're going to come over here on this side. And we're going to talk about rice, as we as we said, right? This is this rice. And I want to show you some of these brands that I use. Because a lot of you ask, like, what do you use? What are you making? And I want to make these things accessible to you, right? There are things that I use in my kitchen that are um, maybe not in your town. But I feel like you could get this, right? And I want you to use um, this rice uh, or like a long grain uh, brown, right? But I love an organic long grain basmati if I have it, right? Um, sometimes uh, dishes like paella and, and others are made with what they call broken rice, right? Which is, which is like a, a, a much shorter grain. Uh, but in this case, I like this grain size for what we're doing today, if that makes sense. Okay. Do Dr. Amin, is basmati a, uh, um, is it a white rice? Um, and it, you know, it, it sort of is. Um, but what we have to think about in terms of um, our rices is that the super starchy rices that got bred out of what we brought with us to this new world um, as people of the African, uh, as, as African people who became part of the diaspora is not the same as things like the basmati white or some of the other rices that we had that are really like gray rices. They are things that are nutrient dense still. And that's why I like this particular rice. You see what I'm saying? I want you to have an organic rice that's not bred to be super starchy or parboiled, none of that. Well, what are some examples of like the super starchy ones? Oh my gosh. Almost any white rice you find in the store, um, you go to a restaurant, unfortunately, the rice is going to be that very cheap, super starchy bread out rice. And you can taste it. It just it, it just gives up the ghost way too easily in your mouth. I like, like the some, mushy kind and yeah, everything. It yeah, it just, 
or it's it's white like that Uncle Ben's weird right you know what I yeah, mean yeah right 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 and I don't want no black man on the box look like he's enslaved like stop it so um, this rice I like if you want a rice that performs like a white rice and we're not unfamiliar to these rices just to be clear okay we just don't want the starchy weird stuff okay so this is a nice rice I really like this a lot. Um, what we're going to do with this rice, I'm going to make yellow rice for you because that's a classic Puerto Rican dish. And I feel like you deserve yellow rice in your life. Lots of us like it. Lots of us um, appreciate yellow rice. The color is beautiful. It's like, like a saffron color. Um, and that's due to the spices I'm going to show you and how that's made. It also requires love inside of there that is not necessarily in the yellow rice that you may be getting or tasting out and about, okay? Because if some Puerto Rican people ain't make it or some Cubans or Dominicans, you know what I'm saying? So I want to give you how this rice is really made, not something that people threw yellow or, or um, uh, Goya, fuck Goya, and you put Goya and they have Goya in it and it's like the saison, the thing. We're gonna do it the way it's supposed to be done. And it just tastes different. You feel a whole sense of love inside of there. Cool? All right, so we're gonna use this rice. Ali said, go this way. So I'm gonna show you also, we're gonna talk about um, what is mafongo, right? So when we talk about the overlying, overreaching areas of our, um, and this is a muddler, so I'm using the sharp teeth end and I'm um, uh, mashing our cornmeal. This is a cornmeal. And mofongo can be made with cornmeal. It also um, very typically is made with ripe plantains or green plantains that are very starchy, like almost ripe plantains or green. These are very ripe. These are maduro, right? So these are ripe, sweet plantains I made for you. And yes, this is paper towel because I want to be authentic. Like we're growing up in the kitchen. This is how the oil is strained. I use a little coconut oil because I want a little sweetness. Plus the coconut oil withstands heat in a completely different way. When you have coconut oil, it gives a beautiful flavor to the plantains. Like a, it lends this Mm, this like tropical feeling, but also coconut oil is, it withstands heat, like high heats a lot better than other oils, meaning it doesn't oxidize at those heat levels. In a pot, I don't need much of this oil at all. If your pot is hot, not smoking, but if it's hot and then you put your oil after it's hot, right? And I would say for this amount of plantains, which is not very much at all, um, this was one plantain, okay? And never in my life have I made one plantain as plantain. <laughs> but it's one what man. I had. I couldn't find any ones that I really loved and I wanna serve you what I love. So I only found one, you're gonna get this one and it's gonna be delicious. So what we did with this is heat the oil and then I had cut the plantains on a bias. That's typically what happens. They get cut on these angles. And then I laid it into the pot you brown it on one side, you turn it over. Let me tell you something. Never turn your back on plantains, okay? It's like the ocean. You just don't know what might be coming. Don't turn your back to the ocean. You don't know what's happening. You don't know what's happening. These plantains will go up in flames like this. And when I say flames, I don't mean like literal flames, but like they will be burnt beyond belief. And all you did was walk to look at who's out the window because you heard a noise. And when you walk back, plantains is like, mm, like this color, okay? And it's almost no salvaging it because it's so lean. It's like, what are you going to do? Cut that part off? It's not toast. You can't scrape it. So be clear on making sure you take good care of your plantains. I pulled this paper bag like I ripped it and put it because like i said i wanted you to see the authentic look of a caribbean kitchen that's how it gets drained <laughs> okay we use what we have so let's go back to the mofongo because you may use some people use the right plantains for the mofongo typically you're going to use green or just touching like that almost ripe like it's just turning 
Um, you can also use cornmeal as a, as a substrate, as a, as a um, fungo substitute if you don't have plantains where you are. I always want to show you what to use. I always want to show you, you can get this, you can do this, you can do this. I don't want to give you things that make it impossible for you to make these dishes. I don't like those kind of recipes. When people give me recipes and then it's stuff I can never find, I'm like, this is not useful to me. So I'm always going to give you the alternatives. Sound good? All right. So you would put this a lot of times in a bowl and um, it also could be in a big mortar, kind of pestle mortar, and then you're going to mash it. And I love this particular one. If you see in here, um, this muddler has teeth and they're very sharp. And so I like being able to mash my joint and keep it bubbling. I have things to do. And then I want it, cons you know, very good consistency inside of here. And when we made our porridges, if you go back to, to that, the cornmeal is super easy with that too. If you're going to make mofongo, typically after you fry your plantains or some people um, lightly boil them, then you would put that in here and do the same thing. And you're going to ma basically make a mush. What this says to us is that the mush that was made, right? And I want to keep calling it mush, right? It's like a fufu. The name of fungo comes from uh, the Angolan folks who were kidnapped and brought, and they were the last layer of people brought from West Africa, from Central Africa, right? To, would you say Central Africa? For yes, yeah, well, the West Coast, but Central Africa yeah. as a region. Still yeah. West Side. Yeah, still West Side. Okay, so West Side, right? I need to twist up my fingers. <laughs> so from that Western coast, you found most of those people were brought to Brazil. Right. And then you found that the, another set of folks was brought to Puerto Rico and some of those windward islands, they call it that side of the Caribbean, the eastern Caribbean. And so they brought with them mofongo, which still persists as a dish. It is classically Puerto Rican and it is really just our fufu. It is something you're putting in the bowl instead of rice. So I'm giving you alternatives. Right. And that, or people have that and they have the mofongo, but they have small portions of each. And then you're going to put whatever you're making, like you're typically, it's like a sauteed um, meat of some kind or chicken or whatever you're making. And that goes on top of the mofongo, like in your bowl, you make a little dip. You know what I mean? Like, like you would in mashed potatoes. We still do that, right? We make a dip in our food, like our rice, and we put the gravy because that's the bowl for the sauce. We love sauces. African people love gravy. You don't serve us nothing dry. We're just not going to do it. Okay. So these are your um, abilities to start your food. Okay. So